Now, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about, uh, um, I don't know if this, type, this title makes sense, right? Disciple making would be disciple makers, okay? So um, we're still continuing on the series of, uh, the series on a healthy church, uh, engineering a, a symposium DNA. So disciple making would be disciple makers, okay? Now, um, if you notice, the sermons in our series, A Healthy Church. Okay? I do not address complicated matters. Do you guys notice that? I don't really address complicated matters. I like complicated matters. Right? That's pretty much how I naturally think. Right? But I don't address complicated matters. You know, so for example, we talk about known by love. Right? That was the first sermon. Uh, we talked about working together in unity. So this is just basic information. Embodying God's truth. Sustained by faith. Right? Uh, radically committed to Christ, worshiping God. And then this time we're going to talk about disciple making, would be disciple makers. Now, one thing you have to understand is this a healthy church is like a healthy body. In order to have a healthy body, you just need to do the basic things that you do in life in the most excellent way possible. Am I correct here? We have some uh, medical professionals here, right? Uh, you know, so. Uh, you just need to do what? The basic things, right? So, for example, you need to eat the right kinds of food. I don't, right? So, but, <laughs> but that's what you're supposed to do, okay? Uh, drink the right kinds of drinks, right? I drink a lot of soda, so, <laughs> right? Now, so, uh, right amount of sleep, okay? Uh, regularly exercising, regular visits with your doctor, right? That system in Amherst is reminding me about that, right? <laughs> right, now, but, but the point is this. You just need to do basic things in order for you to have what? A healthy body. The same thing for the church. We don't need to make this sound too theological, right? Uh, you just need to do the basic things in order to have a what? A healthy church. Now, um, to have a healthy body is not, a comp is not as complicated as what we think. To have a healthy church should also not be as complicated as what we think. In the same way that we fail to do what we are supposed to do to have a healthy body, we also fail to do what we are supposed to do to have a healthy church. Are you guys following me here? In the same way that we somehow neglect, you know, the things that we need to do in order to have a healthy body. In the same way, we do the same thing when it comes to what? Church, okay? Now, so, misconceptions about the task of the church. Okay, let me uh, say a few things about this. Why do we exist as a church? You know, I always ask that myself. You know, why do we exist as a church? Keep in mind, we do not exist as a church to simply perpetuate traditional habits. Oh, thank you, Jean. Right? We do not uh, exist just to simply what? Perpetuate what? Traditional habits. Uh, when I talk about traditional habits, I mean, you know, going to church on Sundays, right? Uh, for an hour and a half, and then go home, right? And then, you know, do your prayers, right? You know, uh, we're not existing as a church just to actually continue that traditional habit. Okay? We don't exist as a church to provide means to entertain people on Sundays. Okay? We don't, that, that's not what we do. Right? So uh, we don't exist as a church to have an institution that supports you know, condemnations of other people. That's not why we exist. Okay? Now, so at least one of our tasks is to turn people into disciples of Christ. And if we miss that, then we somehow uh, if we miss that, we somehow what? Uh, you guys know Francis Chan, right? That famous uh, preacher, uh, a, pastor, a former pastor of a mega church, Francis Chan. Um, I, I think he wrote the book, The Crazy Love, or something like that. Okay. I, I watched uh, an interview with Francis Chan, because you know what he did, right? He left this big church. Uh, and, uh, he, and he actually started like you know, a, a, a network of house churches. Uh, with like probably, I don't know, 12, 15 people per, per, per group. Uh, he left his uh, church, uh, his church started in his house uh, with a small group of people and then suddenly it grew to like thousands. But he left it. Why? Because according to him, he felt that he was actually not discipling people. People go to church and they actually hate each other. They don't even want to talk to each other right on Sundays because it's too big of a group. Do you guys follow what I'm actually pointing out here? Yeah. And I'm not, it's not coming from my mouth, you know, it's coming from his mouth. 
And that's the reason why he actually resigned from his job pastoring a big church. Right now, so, so the point I want to make is that this is really the task of the church, is to actually turn disi uh, people into what? Disciples. Disciples of Christ. Now, and if we miss that, then we fail. Okay? Now, why do we want family members, friends, and even strangers to become Christians? You know, I was actually, uh, I was, uh, one, uh, there was, I, I went to a, me I was a mechanic this, uh, this week. Uh, to, to get uh, Florence's car fixed. And then I met a guy, um, uh, you know, because I, 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 I was wearing this shirt that says Guapo. Okay, and then so another sort of, it's a Tagalog word for handsome. Okay, and then, uh, and then this uh, uh, one Filipino guy in that uh, mechanic uh, in, that, in the shop actually approached me and he says, oh, you're Filipino. And then we started talking. And then I was thinking of witnessing to him and telling him about Christ. But somehow, in the back of my mind, I asked the question, why do I want him to be a Christian? Why do I want him to be a Christian? Because somehow I was actually struck, and uh, somehow I was a bit, what, confused about how to actually answer that question. Why do I want this guy, who seemed to be living a good life, right? Why do I want him to become a Christian? So somehow I have to what? I have to figure that out for myself, right? Now, so, um, you know, am I, am I asking them to go, am I, am I thinking of witnessing to them because I want them to become good people? Am I going to invite them to church, right, because I want them to become what? Good people? Now, there are many good people who are already outside of the church. They don't even have to go to church, and they're still what? And they're still good. Are you guys following what I'm actually pointing out here? There are people who actually are not in church, and they're good people. So it must not be, you know, I don't invite people to church because I want them to become good people. Okay, right? Um, so so, so uh, some people might think, oh, we bring them to church to make sure that they will end up in heaven and not in hell. Right? But if that is your motivation for actually bringing people to church, then the, the, cent the, the centrality of Christ is uh, what? Gone. Because it looks like we invite people, right, for, for, for the sake of what? Of humans, it's not for the sake of what? Christ. The centrality of Christ is somehow what? Gone. Now, so the point is this. At least one of the reasons is to turn them into what? Disciples of Jesus. That's the reason why we're actually bringing people to church. Because we want them to become disciples of, disciples of Jesus. Most of the time... The reasons that we provide in response to such question, why do we want our family members and other people to become Christians? Somehow it exhibits, the, our responses exhibit our, our sole concern for our own selves, <coughs> our own concern for the people, rather than, you know, we want them to become Christians so they, they can contribute in building what? The kingdom of what? Right. The centrality is not, it's not centered on humans, but it's actually centered on what? On God, it's centered on Christ. Um, I hope I'm making sense here. Okay, right. Word of the day: discipleship. Can you say that with me? Discipleship. discipleship. Now, disciple making, would be disciple makers, is at the heart of the calling of all Christians. We need to disciple others in order to turn them into what disciple makers. That's at the heart of our calling. You know, when I invited you to join symposia a long time ago. Right? That is my goal, is to actually what? Disciple people. Hopefully, discipling people who can disciple what? Others. Yes. Okay? Right? Now, you know, like ants, right? We have specific roles in God's kingdom. We do everything that we can within the scope of what we can do to turn each individual who is under our care into disciple of what? Of Jesus. And in turn, turn him or her into a what? Disciple maker. So the first task is to turn people into becoming what? Disciples of Christ. And then after that is to turn them into what? Disciple makers for Christ. Now, uh, he or she is supposed to disciple another person in order for that other person to, be, to disciple what? Others. Yeah. So I'm here to disciple you, and then you are supposed to what? Disciple other people, and then to whoever you disciple are supposed to what? Disciple more people. That's it's supposed to be how it's supposed to work. As a church, we need to disciple as many people as we can. 
in order for them to disciple more people. We are bearers of God's message of hope, and it has to be shared to as many people as possible. Now, my hope is that as I disciple you, you will disciple others. Let's help each other out, right, for the sake of building God's kingdom. That is one of the tasks of the church. And if you fail to understand that, right, uh, then uh, somehow um, you will actually misperceive what it means to be what? A Christian. Right? Rick Warren always say, it's not about you, but it's about what? Yeah. It's about God. Can you say that with me? It's not about you, but it's about what? It's about God. Right. Um, so discipleship is always going to be like that. You are being discipled so that you can actually disciple others for Christ. Okay. Now, so let's look at the passage here. We're going to look at the Great Commission. And this is the only passage we'll be looking at today. So it's very simple. Uh, so it says Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Many of you already know this. Uh, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Remember, this, is, this was actually uh, the last word of Jesus before he what? Before he ascended. Okay, I forgot, right? We actually have a new equipment now, okay? Uh, uh, from uh, the De La Fuente family, right? Uh, uh, the point, I don't even know what you call this. Laser pointer. Laser pointer. Laser pointer, right? So let's look at this, okay? Uh, uh, high tech, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's look at this. Uh, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Again, I pointed out that this was actually the last, the last uh, commandment, uh, the last commission that was actually given by Jesus before he what? Before he left. So it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of what? The age. The age. Sorry, I'm still not used to this, okay? I'll, I'll get used to it so at some point. <laughs> <Don't ask me. laughs> right? Now, so, uh, so it says, go and make disciples of all what? Nations. That was the last thing that Jesus actually asked his disciples to do, is to make what? Disciples. disciples. Now, uh, let me define discipleship for you before we actually look at the text. Uh, this is at least how I define it, okay? When I give you definition, usually I just come up with a definition. This is at least how I understand it. So let's look at discipleship here. It says, discipleship is doing everything that one can do in order to turn another person into a committed follower of what? Jesus. Of Jesus. Now, we're not, I'm not turning you to become my followers. I hope you guys know that, <laughs> right? Uh, so, uh, I hope, I, 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 hope I, I, don't, I, I hope it doesn't look like that, okay? I'm not, I don't want to be my followers, okay? Right? That would be, uh, that would be uh, a too heavy of a burden for me, right? If you guys are following me, okay? So discipleship is doing everything that one can do in order to turn another person into a committed follower of Jesus who will in turn turn other people into committed followers of what? Does that sound like a reasonable, sensible definition of discipleship? Yeah. That's it. That's very simple, right? So what do we mean when we say committed follower of Jesus? A committed follower of Jesus is one who will do whatever is within his or her power and resources to bring about on earth whatever Jesus wants to what? Accomplish. Right. Everything that you do, right? You know, uh, when people bring food, right? All of that, you're doing that for what? Because you want it somehow, you know, to, to make uh, to make the services, uh, you know, more more welcoming to people, because so that we can actually disciple people more. When you give, right, uh, you do the same thing again. Everything is somehow what uh, pointing towards discipling people. I hope you guys are following me here, right? So, a commit follower of Jesus is one who will do whatever is within his or her power and resources to bring about on earth whatever Jesus wants to accomplish. We are called to become disciples of Jesus for a specific purpose, to help others become followers of Jesus. That's a, one of the reasons why we exist as what? As a church. I hope that's clear. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we're not, we didn't start a church so that we can have a business so that we will have what? Money in our pockets, right? 
we are here because we want people to become more <coughs> followers of Jesus. Yeah. You know, it might be like, you know, one person at a time that we actually invite to, to uh, symposia and become a disciple of Christ. But uh, keep in mind, right, that, that you know, it, it has nothing to do with the quantity, right? But it has something to do with what? The quality. Yeah. Okay? Right? Now, so uh, discipleship defined. Now, so uh, more about discipleship here. Discipleship is an inward-looking activity of Christians. You know, when you're disi discipleship means you cultivate your heart and your mind, right, to become what? Christian. Right? You need to have a Christian mind. You need to have a Christian heart. And uh, discipleship means what? Cultivating that. Okay? But at the same time, discipleship is also what? An outward-looking activity. Right? Through discipleship, we help others to have a Christian mind and what? A Christian heart. That's why discipleship, at least for me, it means renewing minds, transforming lives. The way to transform people's, people's lives is by actually what? Renewing their Doing their, doing their minds. You know, every time I preach, every time I teach here, what, 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 am I, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to figure out a way how to renew people's what? Minds. Because that's really uh, the key to having a transformed what? Transformed life. The renewal of one's mind. Now, so, so what is the process of discipleship? Let, let's actually look at the next slide, please. Right? The process of discipleship. The process of discipleship is actually very simple. And I know it sounds a little uh, boring to just look at some basic information here about Christianity. But I think once in a while we need to be reminded of this. Okay? Uh, the process of discipleship is very simple. Sharing the gospel to others. Okay? Belonging to the body of what? Christ. Teaching them about what Jesus taught. And then teaching them to become what? Disciple me. That's so easy. Uh, sharing the gospel to others, and you want them to belong to what? The body of Christ, and then you teach them about what Jesus taught, and then become a disciple maker. Right? There's really, it sounds like it's not as, not as exciting, okay? But that's really what it is. That's really what it is that we're supposed to be what? To be doing, okay? So let me actually start by, with the first one. Sharing the gospel to others. Okay? Now, According to Paul in Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of what? Christ. How do you end up with faith? From what you actually want. That's why someone has to share the gospel to others. Now, um, so message from Christ, sharing of the word, hearing of the word is supposed to bring about what? Faith. Okay? Now, Someone has to tell others about the gospel. But what is the gospel? Have you ever actually stepped back and even wondered, what exactly is the gospel? What is the gospel? The gospel is a good news, but what is the good news? What is the good news? That Christ died yeah. for you. Say it again. That Christ died for you. That Christ died for us, right? But, but what if the good news sounds irrelevant to the listeners? You guys follow what I'm actually pointing out here? Suppose you say, the gospel or the good news is that Christ died for you. I'm pretty sure many of the young people today will actually look at us and wonder, what are they talking about? <laughs> they'll, probably, uh, they'll probably tell us, what, what do you mean Jesus died for me? Why does he need to even die for me? Do you guys follow what I'm actually pointing out here? No, and that's, and I, and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing what Christian faith actually is, because that's really what the gospel is. But the problem is that if we tell that to people who live in the 21st century, people will probably look at us and wonder, what, what is that? What does that mean? <laughs> what, are <you> talking about? <laughs> what are you talking about? What do you mean Jesus died for me? Why? Why does he need to die for me? Right? Now, so, so the point I want to make is this, right? Um, if, if we give the good news to, to listeners, but the good news are somehow what, irrelevant to them. Mm -hmm. It will be doomed to have no impact at all. I hope you guys are following me here. Yes. Suppose you tell them, oh, you're a sinner, and then Christ died for you so that you will be saved from your sins. People today would just not understand what that means. Right? Because what happened is that we are actually telling them the message, 
right, with some kind of what, a first century context. Remember during that time, what, what do people do? They sacrifice animals in order to be forgiven of their sins. So we, if you're living in the first century and you tell someone in the first century, hey, Christ died for you in order to save you from your sins, they will understand that right away. But if you tell that to people today, more likely they will not get what it is that you're trying to what? Trying to tell them. I hope you guys are following me here. Yes. Okay? Right? Now, so here's what I think is the good news. Okay? Here's what I think is the good news. Uh, because I think what we need to do is we need to actually find a way to say the same thing in a different way. Yes. Okay? We need to find a way to say what? The same, the same thing yes. in a different way in a different way that will actually make the message relevant to people of today. Yes. I'm not asking you to make compromises. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you to actually say what? The same thing, same. right? But to say it in a bit different what? In a different way. So here's what I think is the gospel, okay? There is a living but invisible God who wants to establish relationships with humans in order to save them from their predicaments such as their sinfulness, sufferings, and death. Are you guys following me? There's this God who's alive and who's actually what? Invisible. He wants to have a relationship with humans. Right? Why? Because he wants to save humans from what? From their predicament. What is the shared predicament of humans? We all sin, we all suffer, and we all what? We all die. I hope you guys are following me here. Right? So this is all relevant for us. Right? Now, so if people, you know, so, so the, the point is this. God sent Jesus to reveal the plan of saving them or saving us. And if people will accept the message, their minds are expected to be renewed and their lives should eventually be transformed as they begin to see their worlds differently. They live with ultimate hope that the redemption that will come from God will ultimately set them free from the bondage of sin, from the bondage of sufferings, and from the bondage of death. You know, these are things that, that worry us, right? Our sinfulness. You know, we're tired of sinning. Are you guys following me? We're trying to figure out how we, how do we what? How do we get away from that? Now, we are prone to suffering. It doesn't matter what your age. You can be a one-year-old, you can be a 90-year-old, you're prone to what? Suffering. Now, you are all, we are all prone to, to, to dying any time. Death is an everyday possibility for everybody. And this is actually a cause of worry for us. And that's the reason why God wants to have a relationship with us. Because God wants to tell us about the plan, right? That he wants to redeem us from that kind of what? Predicament so that we can have ultimate hope. That's it. I think that's what the gospel is. I know it might sound very simple, it sounds very basic, but that's really what the gospel is. Jesus came in order to actually what? Tell us the message of God. I hope that makes sense. Okay? Uh, and again, these are all our worries, right? These are all uh, common worries. You know, uh, when I visited Brother Gino last um, uh, Tuesday, right? You know, you, you know, even when you go to the hospital, right? You, you get to what? You, you get the sense that this is, you know, this is a scary place, okay? That you don't want to be there, okay? Right? Uh, and this is a common problem that we have, a common predicament that we all, uh, that we all uh, share in common. Now, the second point here is this. Belonging to the body of what? Christ. Now, according to the Great Commission, it says, go and make disciples of all nations. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of what? The Holy Spirit. Now, um, you know, I don't want to make it sound complicated, right? But, but when it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you know, that a, they call that in English grammar as partificial, a partificial uh, phrase. Now, what does that mean? That actually tries to modify what? The, the previous claim, the previous, uh, the, a, a, a word in the previous statement. Now, so, so in the previous statement, it says, make disciples of all nations. How do you do that? By baptizing them in the name of what? The Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that mean? You know what? Baptism is an initiation rite. Uh, who among you are actually Catholics or former Catholics? Okay, so uh, so we have. Uh, I was 
was never a, a, a Catholic. But, but in the Catholic Church, uh, for instance, the sacrament of baptism is the sacrament of what? Initiation. That's your uh, way to get into what? To become a part of, of the church. But this is the same concept here, right? By baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, it means you are becoming a part of what? The body of Christ after you are what? Baptized. I hope you guys are following me here, right? Now, so, so the point is that part of the making of disciples is actually baptizing people in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You want them to belong to a church. You want them to belong to the body of Christ. Now, would be disciple makers in order to become uh, in order to become disciples first must belong to the body of Christ. You know, one cannot be a disciple of Jesus independently of the church that Jesus established. You cannot be a disciple of Christ. You know, you can't be like a Rambo Christian. Are you guys following? You're like doing it on your own. Okay. Uh, in, um, 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 uh, you, you become a disciple of Jesus, right, by becoming a part of what? Of a church. The task of making disciples is collaboratively done with others. Okay? Right? Each of us has a role to play in turning a person into a disciple of Christ. And each of us has a role to play in, in turning other people into what? Disciple maker for Christ. We grow together as Jesus' disciples collaboratively. I hope you guys are following me here. That's why there's a need to actually bring people into what? Into the church. Right? Jesus said that, right? By baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I hope you guys are following me here. You want them to belong to what? To a church. To a group of, of believers. Okay? And then the third point here is this. Again, this is another artificial uh, 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 phrase. Teaching, uh, remember where it says teaching them. Right? Every, uh, everything that Jesus actually what, taught you. So it says, teaching about what Jesus taught. Now, you know, rabbis during the time of Jesus had their own disciples. However, Christian leaders should not turn people into being his own what? De de becoming their own disciples, right? I'm not discipling you so that you become my disciple. I'm trying to disciple you so that you will become disciples of what? Of Christ. Now, teaching is a huge part of the ministry of the church. Are you guys following me? Teaching is a huge part of the ministry of the church. Teaching is at the center of the process of turning people into disciples of Christ. Teaching is at the center of turning people into what? Disciple makers. Teaching is the tool of the church to renew people's mind. You know, how do you renew people's mind? Through what? Through teaching. Are you guys following me? How do you renew people's mind? Or how do we renew people's mind in the church? Through what? Through teaching. Right? One of the perks of being a teacher is the opportunity to renew people's minds, students' minds, okay? In order for them to have transformed lives. I've seen this uh, many times. I've been, I've been uh, teaching in college for many years, for probably almost, what, 20 years already. And I've seen how people's lives actually are transformed. I remember I have students in the past who are from Saudi Arabia. And then they attend, uh, they, they enrolled in a philosophy class, and, uh, you know, and I teach them about atheism, right? And different uh, different uh, views about religion. And I remember some of them would approach me after class and they say, in our country, we're not allowed to actually what? Learn this kind of things. Are you guys following me here? Right? But for, for this is my very, very first time to actually uh, recognize that there's, uh, realize that there are actually even arguments for the existence of God. And you guys follow me? Somehow it actually what? It, it changes their minds. It actually renews their minds. Uh, I hope you guys are following me here. Of course, you know, we don't want them not to believe in God. But, but the point I'm trying to make is that somehow through teaching, it actually what? Renews their mind. It changed their way of thinking. I hope I'm making sense here. Right? The same thing that I'm actually doing here at that symposium in some sense. Right? Um, um, that's why I treat teaching as a sacred task. Amen. You know, the teaching ministry of the church, we treat this as somehow sacred here. That's why if you notice, even though I do, do like to talk about politics, 
I don't talk about politics here on the pulpit. Why? Because that's not really the task of what? The pulpit. The task of the pulpit is not to actually tell you something about politics. That's not the task of the pulpit. Uh, I hope, I hope that that's actually clear, right? Uh, the task, the, it's a sacred task. Uh, my task is to actually not to really make you worry too much about uh, uh, temporary matters, right, in politics, at least from the pulpit. Are you guys following me here? Right? But because we actually have a much larger what? Much larger task. Um, I hope that makes sense. We actually have a much larger task. Now, so I am supposed to guide you from being fed with milk, right, to being fed with food for adults. That's my task. That's the task of all the pastors here. That's the task we'll actually what? Preach in this pulpit. I hope I'm making sense here. We're here to guide you from being what? Fed with milk to being fed with what? Well, food for adults, right? Now, um, now, what did Jesus teach? Do you guys know that that's actually a very complicated question to ask? Okay, even a, a complicated, complicated question to answer. Now, why? All of you know that Jesus did not write a book about his teachings. Jesus is like Socrates. They're good teachers, but they did not write books about their teachings. So we actually do not really know what they actually want. Huh. Do you guys know that? We didn't know. Because Jesus didn't write any, any book about his teachings, so we don't know what he really said. The New Testament texts are the only records that we have of his what? Teachings. Right? But keep in mind that, you know, that when you look at this, uh, when you look at, let's say, the New, the New Testament, they were all accounts of some other people, right? About what they heard uh, Jesus taught or what they heard that someone said Jesus actually what? Taught. That's why if, if, you, if you ask the question, what did Jesus really uh, teach? That's actually a very difficult one. <coughs> question to answer. I hope I'm making sense here. What did he really teach, right? Now, it's, it's not very clear now, the, the point I want to make here is this, okay? We look at the New Testament to figure out what Jesus actually taught. Why? Because that's the only record that we have from the first century of what he actually what? Said. Now, are, are the claims in the New Testament text actually uh, true, factual? We would have to assume that it is true or factual. Why? Because that's the only thing we got. You guys follow what I'm pointing out here? That's the only thing what? That's the only thing we got. We really have no other choice, right? So we actually look at the text, the New Testament text, and we glean from the New Testament text what Jesus must have what said. And that's what we do. Now, so it's not, so, so it's, 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 it's in a way that's probably a complicated task, but that's what we do, okay? We look at the New Testament text, we look at what the disciples said, what Jesus said, right? But you guys have to understand, Right? If I tell you something, suppose I tell Gene something right now, and I ask him to whisper it to, uh, to, uh, to Penny, and then to whisper it to Sister Minerva, and then so on. By the time I get to Austin, right, probably, you know, he, yeah, it's probably it. already some, somewhat completely, uh, somewhat <laughs> different already yes. from what I originally was pointed out. Yes. Because the process of transmission of that is always what? He, he, he's interpreting what I said, he, she also is interpreting what he said, she's paraphrasing what I said, Right, and as he interpreted the paraphrase, by the time he gets to Austin, it's not going to be the same thing that I the same from what I actually what, what I just actually said. I hope you guys are following me here, right? So, so this is the problem that we have here. But again, we really have no other choice. That's why we have to somehow trust that somehow the New Testament text actually what preserved the truth that was actually delivered by Jesus. Okay. Now, lastly, becoming a disciple maker. Now, what does that mean? We built God's kingdom on earth by saturating our planet with Jesus' disciples. They are people whose lives have been transformed by Jesus' message. Now, what can we can do that by turning disciples into what? Disciple makers. We want Jesus' disciples to bear fruit by turning others into what? Jesus' that's our task. You know, we do not measure the effectiveness of disciple making quantitatively, right? 
by the numbers of people whom we disciple. You, know, you can be discipling like uh, 10,000 people, but, but, but it can be the case that those 10,000 people will not be disciple makers. Yeah. Do you guys follow what I'm pointing out? Okay. Uh, rather, we measure its effectiveness qualitatively. That is by the depth of the commitments of the people whom we turn into what? Jesus' disciples. I hope, I'm, I hope you guys are following me. Uh, now, according to Matthew 9, 35 to 38, this is, what, this is what it says. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are not. That's why we need to actually get into this business of what? Discipling people in order to become disciple makers. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people that need to be harvested. But the problem is that very, very few people are doing it. Do you guys know that you can have uh, a 10,000 member church? <coughs> but it can only be the case that only 200 of them are actually what? Really sold out for Jesus. Do you guys follow what I'm actually pointing out? What point you can have actually, you can have like 10,000 10, members and only 200 of them are actually what? Sold out for Jesus. The other people are just going there because you know, it's fun to be there and blah, blah, blah. Right? Now, so, 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 so the task is to actually turn people into what? Disciple, disciple makers. Okay? Um, now, what are the roadblocks to discipleship? I, I don't have it on the uh, PowerPoint. But what are the roadblocks to discipleship? Now, I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but I am thinking of actually pre preparing a series of sermons on the roadblock to, to what? Discipleship. I'm just looking at the time here. Now, let me give you a few. And I'm almost done. We will be done early today. Okay. Uh, one roadblock to Christian discipleship is actually our Pharisaic tendencies. One roadblock to what? Christian discipleship is that our Pharisaic what? tendencies. You know, the reason why a lot of Christians do not grow is because they are actually stuck in their legalism. They're legalistic. Are you guys following me here? Um, I hope I'm making sense here. Right? You will not grow if you will continue with that kind of mentality. You will never grow if you have actually that kind of mentality. If you have the mentality of the Pharisees. Right? You're always concerned about you know, how you do things and how other people do things. You're always trying to figure out you know, what to condemn. Right? You know, trying to look for some, uh, something to condemn people, uh, uh, to condemn people okay? for whatever it is that they do. Okay? Now, if you have that kind of tendencies, it will be very difficult for you to actually grow as a disciple of what? Of Jesus. Now, love of wealth or greed is also one of the roadblocks to what? Christian discipleship. The reason why a lot of people fail to grow because of their love of wealth and their greed. I hope I'm making sense here. They cannot go to church because they have other things that they are actually what concerned with, right? Um, I, I hope I'm making sense here. They cannot really do anything for Jesus. Why? Because they are actually what consumed by all of their what activities, right? That will actually make them what more money. Okay. Now, another thing is that our worries about our basic necessities. You know, that's the reason why it's hard for us to grow as what? As a disciple? It's because we're so worried about our basic what? Necessities. You know, when Jesus actually sent the disciples, he told them not to bring anything with them. Right? Because somehow our concern for basic necessities is the one that is actually what? Pulling us down. That's the reason why we're not actually what? Growing into becoming disciples of Jesus. Now, another thing is <coughs> selfishness. You will never grow uh, as a disciple of Christ if you actually continue in your what? Selfishness. I hope you guys are following me here. These are roadblocks to Christian discipleship. Uh, envy, right? You will not grow as a disciple of, G of, of Jesus, right, if you're actually consumed by what? 
by envy, right? Uh, hatred, right? You will not grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ if you are actually consumed by your what? By your hatred, okay? Uh, you will not grow as a disciple of Christ if you have this what? Unforgiveness. I hope you guys are following me here, right? You know, these are roadblocks to, to actually Christian discipleship. It's hard for you to grow if you are actually, if there are people whom you, you haven't what? Forgiven yet. I hope you guys are following me here, right? Sometimes, you know, when you forgive someone, you know, there's a sense of what release. Okay? I hope you guys are following me here, right? Another thing is that uh, busyness, okay? Uh, uh, and, you know, if you are too busy about your life, then it will be really hard to grow into becoming what? A disciple of Christ. And we are all busy, right? I'm, busy too, right? This is the, 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 the constant struggle that we all have, right? Is that we're too busy. Uh, another thing that I think that is a roadblock to Christian discipleship is immaturity. You guys follow me here? Immaturity. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, I know about a gene, I'll use, you know, I'll use it as an example, he's actually a mature person. Right? How do I know that? We had disagreements in the past, right? But he was very mature, right? Uh, but somehow we we were able to actually what reconcile, and and we are living now as if nothing even happened. Yes, yes. That's how that's how it works, yeah. right? Uh, that, that's how we grow. Yes. If we will not be like that, right? Uh, it will be very difficult for us to grow. Immaturity will actually hinder us from actually what from actually growing into becoming disciples of Jesus. Amen. I hope you guys are following me yes. here, right? Now, so what is our goal as a church? As a church, One is to turn those who are not disciples yet into disciples of Jesus. That's our goal. We want them to become disciples of Jesus. And then to turn those who are already disciples of Jesus into disciple makers for Christ. Okay. And then lastly, I want to point this out. We want Symposia to be a place where we take seriously the process of discipleship. Amen. I want Symposia to be a place where we take seriously uh, the process of what? Discipleship. Um, I hope you guys are following me here. And so this is going to be part of the core of what we will be, you know, of, of our focus as a church. It's actually discipling people. Because we want people to become disciples of Jesus. But of course, we cannot make people become disciples of Jesus if we are not disciples of Jesus ourselves. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I know, you know you can be at church for a long time without being a disciple of Jesus. You can just be a follower of a religion. You can just be a follower of, the, uh, of a denomination. You can just be a follower of the pastor. Okay. I hope you guys are following me. But, but it's different when you can say that you are a disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm. If each and every one of us here can actually say, right, that I am a disciple